Good morning. Welcome to St. Louis Chinese Gospel Church. We hope that everybody's had a great week and looking forward to another week and that everybody's staying safe and healthy. Uh, we thank you again for uh, continuing to worship with us. Uh, I know that uh, we know that this sometimes can get difficult and watching a video every week uh, we know isn't quite the same as if we were all able to get together. But, you know, as, as it stands right now, we just feel that this is a safer approach and um, we hope that, Lord willing, we will be back together worshiping uh, together in, in the sanctuary sometime soon. Um, Pastor Paul this week is uh, continuing on his uh, sermons on idolatry um, and what happens when we allow things to take God's place in our lives. And actually this morning, um, it's going to be a little tough for him uh, based on the topic. So just uh, as we prepare to receive God's word, just pray for Pastor Paul to be uh, uh, bold and courageous and discerning in how he delivers this message. And I think when you hear it, uh, you'll understand what I mean. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalms 135, verse 3 and 5. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. I know that the Lord is great. Our Lord is above all gods. And again, as Pastor Paul has been talking about this, this concept of idolatry, which is we allow other things to supplant the true God in our lives and... and um, allow those to sort of become gods. And, and I think uh, in our call to worship is, you know, I'll, our Lord is above all gods. And as I was thinking about that um, sort of in my own life, uh, going back to when the pandemic started, um, I was binge watching a lot of TV, um, partially because I had nothing to do at work um, and partially because I just had a bunch of idle time on my hands. And... Um, in a way, it, it did affect um, my life in terms of, you know, staying up late to catch that last episode and then sleeping in in the morning and, you know, a lot of other things that it, how it affected my schedule. And, you know, I, when I could have been filling that even with a little bit more of, you know, reading the Bible, spending a little more time with God. So, you know, I think sometimes idolatry in our lives just creeps in and we don't even, you know, I wasn't worshiping the TV, but was I really, if I was watching an entire season of Bosch in one night? Um, so anyway, as we think about that um, and our confession of idolatry, um, it said, in Romans it says, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So as we prepare to receive God's word this morning, let's spend a moment to silently confessing about how maybe we've let things creep into our lives and how we've sort of made creation, things that God has created more important in our lives uh, than the creator, than God has. So let's just spend a moment silently confessing. Dear Father, thank you for just being a loving and, and uh, awesome God and for uh, all of your creation, whether it's sort of uh, nature or man-made. We know that um, what you've created um, are good things. And uh, as we've been listening, we understand that how we, um, as a fallen uh, mankind, can take a beautiful thing, can take a, a wonderful thing and allow it to uh, corrupt our lives and, and allow it to take a place in our hearts that supplants you and, and um, shoves you aside. So Lord, please forgive us for that. Help us to look and whether it's a sport that we're involved in, a hobby, uh, technology, um, there's so many things that um, are good, but that we allow to um, take an, take an, uh, 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 take your place in our lives. So please forgive us for that. Listen to our prayers. Um, and uh, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And our assurance of salvation um, comes from Psalms 135. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all generations. The Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. So we thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we hope that uh, you will listen to the message with a ten of ears and pray that Pastor Paul will deliver uh, a message that speaks to all of us. Uh, as we get ready to return uh, some praise to the Lord, we uh, hope that you have an upcoming wonderful week. And I know a lot of kids are getting ready to go back to school, either virtually or in person. So uh, we keep all our kids and our children in our prayers. And we hope to see you again next week. Thanks.
Good morning. Um, and actually, before we begin, I do kind of want to give you a little bit of a, of a warning. Um, if you have little, tiny, small kids, you might not want to have them watch along with us uh, today as we continue talking about idolatry in images and digital images. I kind of want to talk about watching inappropriate movies and inappropriate images and pictures and uh, things like that. So if you have little kids, you know, you might want to kind of stop and watch this first before you have them. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to say anything that your boys, your teenage boys, your young boys don't know about and your daughters don't know about. You know, they get into, you know, fifth, sixth grade, middle school, high school. I'm not going to talk about anything that they don't know. And this is probably really important for them. So uh, now that I've gotten this done, um, we're going to talk this morning about one form of idolatry that is the um, altar of sexual idolatry, um, namely in the form of uh, pornography. But before we do, we need to know that as people, uh, young boys that start out a lot of times at 10, 11 years old when their friends pull something up on their cell phone and show them, uh, through adulthood, through teenage boys, through young college students. You know, it affects a lot of people today. And um, so it has to start out with us. We need to know, beginning, that God is a great, powerful, mighty God, and that he's a good God, and he has chosen us for his own, and he will redeem us, because this uh, particular form of idolatry, um, that is addiction to pornography, and other sexual forms of addiction are very, very powerful. So we need to know that we have a greater God, and we need to know that we have a God who cares and is good for us. So this is going to be from Psalm 135, and, and there's a part of what we're going to read that is also paralleled in Psalm 115, and so I'll go over there. And so here, Psalm 135, and this isn't the whole thing, I just picked out about half of it, and it says here, the psalmist says, I know that the Lord, that Yahweh is great, that he's powerful. And our Lord, he is above all gods. He's superior to every god. And then he switches to talking about the Exodus. And this is really important because the Exodus is where people are set free from slavery. And if we're struggling, if anybody is struggling with a problem of any kind of addiction, especially a digital addiction or a sexual addiction, they need power to be set free. So he says, our Lord is great. He's above all gods. And he struck down the firstborn of the Egyptian. That was the last of the ten plagues. And he sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and his servants. And he struck down many nations. And we need to remind ourselves that each of the plagues in the Exodus had to do with defeating one kind of god or idol that the Egyptians had. And then we also need to know that slavery in Egypt, slavery to Pharaoh, and slavery to all of his servants and those idols are a picture of telling us what it means to be a slave to Satan, a slave to sin, and a slave to any kind of sin or idolatry that there is, and God sets us free. And then he says that the Lord, he will vind vindicate. He will vindicate. He will make right things for his people, and he will have compassion on his servants. And then he talks about idols. And they had idols of stone, silver, gold, and today we have idols that a lot of times are created by video and on TV and um, are computer-generated. So he says that the idols of the nations, they're just silver gold. Maybe wood, maybe stone, 
but also silver and gold, and they're the work of human hands. And today we have computer-generated images, but they're still idols. The technology is the same, or the technology has changed, but idolatry is still the same. Then he goes on to say, look, you've got to understand about them. The idols, they have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, they do not see. They have ears, they do not hear. And the most important thing is write what it says here. Because you're going to tell me, okay, well, you know, digital video kinds of idolatry. And in pornography, you see people that speak, it looks like they hear, it looks like they uh, see, they have mouths, they can walk, they can move around, they can do all kinds of things. So this doesn't apply. But, but this is the point, and that is that they have no breath inside of them. They have no breath in them, and, and I'll explain that that means that they have no spirit. They have no soul. And those who make them will become like them, and that's actually the real problem is that when somebody worships an idol, you become like it, but when he says that there's no breath, that means you have no soul. So those who make them become like the idols, and so will all who trust in them. So let me just pray real quickly. Almighty God, I do pray that you will help me to speak truthfully, honestly, powerfully, and graciously um, about the world that we live in today. In your name I pray. Amen. Um, so many of you parents may hear your kids, your teen kids, talk about influencers. And, and you know, there's influencers that are on YouTube or Instagram, you know, or Snapchat or Twitter. And, you know, they influence, they have these channels, and then they are also used to sell things. So they get a big following, and then people come to them, and then they sell, and that's how they make their money. But notice this article. This is the, from an article. This picture is from an article in a techno technology in a computer magazine. It says, who are the highest earning robot influencers? And of course, you might know it's not the really robot influencers, but actually bot influencers or computer-generated influencers. And today, there's kind of a new modeling. Modeling agencies are changing in Asia, in Europe, and then in the United States. And that is that a lot of models are actually not human beings. They're computer-generated. And, you know, there's a couple of kids here that are Japanese and if you look at them, they look very, very real. And, and the woman is Emma Graham. Emma Graham. Uh, she's a Japanese computer-generated influencer and plastic boy. And you can see, you know, they have created all kinds of Instagram following. They've got pictures, but it's all computer-generated. These are not real pictures. And really, there's a question that's being asked here by this Italian, as who is influencing who? You know, they look real, but who's influencing who? Because this is artificial intelligence that's creating these things. There's algorithms, and then they send out stuff, but these bots, it's computer generated. And so I'm just going to show you one picture. This is Plastic Boy, Plastic Boy and Immigram, who you saw before, and if you look at them, they're incredibly human-looking. And the thing about them for models and for other forms of digital entertainment is that their features are perfect. They can have perfect skin. They can have perfect proportion to not only their faces but to their bodies. But the people that are operating them computer, that are creating them on the computer, they can do anything they want. And so these are called CGI, Computer Generated Influencers. But we have to worry also that technology that is good, that talks about and creates images of things that are part of God's good creation, also are used for CGI, Computer Generated Idolatry. And probably one of the biggest forms of computer generated idolatry that I'm reading about and learning about recently is computer generated pornography. And we have to really kind of come to grips with it. Somebody at Covenant Seminary on Facebook, a pastor, he kind of warned us. He, I, I saw a post, he said, you guys need to learn about this kind of particular anime, anime pornography. 
out of Asia and computer generated pornography because he's learning that kids are picking this stuff up really quick and parents, their parents are not cluing into it. So we need to be aware of it so that we can protect our children, our sons, our daughters, but also protect our own marriages. But we have to begin to talk about the power of pornography which enslaves people by first talking about who God is. God is a great God and he is a good God. And so in this particular passage he calls us to worship God, to praise him. But it talks about a couple of things. First, Psalm 135, 5. The Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, he's great, he's powerful. That's what it talks about. And then he's above all gods. And this is really important because when we're going to talk about the Exodus, there's ten gods that he kind of lays down, or nine gods that he sort of lays to the ground and proves that he's more powerful than, so that he can redeem and rescue and give freedom to his people that are enslaved. But then he says to praise him because he's good. So we have to understand these three things. He's great, he's powerful, he's above every single thing that could ever bring us into slavery, any God, and that he's good and he cares about us as his chosen people. And I kind of want to talk about two opposites. One, that there are idols, there are false gods, and these gods are deceptive. They're a lie, they're empty inside, but above all, they're lifeless. When I say lifeless, I mean they have no soul. And then there's the truth about God's power, and God's power is for us and our good, to rescue us, to redeem us, but above all, God's power comes to us when we pray. So, I do want to talk about this. Um, so, let's tra- start out with false gods, idols, are always deceptive. And again, from last week, idols are always something that's from God's good creation, that God's good technology that he gives us, that gets distorted, but idols are a lie. And so, here, he tells us that idols Idols are of silver and gold in the work of men's hands. And they were 2,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago, but today they're digital. Today, a lot of the idols that we look at are either through video images or through digital images and computer-created images, but image is the issue. And so I kind of think we're about Romans 1. Romans Paul says uh, that sin, all sin originally comes from idolatry. So before he begins to talk about sin in chapter 1, 2, and 3, he really begins with idolatry. And that's the real problem. Sin flows from idolatry. So he says here, quoting from Jeremiah, he says, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God, the God that is eternal, that never is corruptible for an image. And that's what we need to see. It's an image of something that's in God's creation. And one of the things can be a corruptible man or a corruptible woman. And it's an image, and it's something that we think, you know, will give us some kind of satisfaction, that will give us some kind of security, that will give us some kind of meaning. And that's actually, I'm gonna tell you something about pornography, what I've learned is that people fall into it because they think it will give them satisfaction. And if you're married, sometimes people fall into it because they feel safer and they feel that there's a kind of intimacy that they can have with pornography that they don't feel safe with their spouse, they don't feel safe with their husband, they don't feel intimate with their husband, and it's kind of a substitute for that. It's this image, but it's a lie. That's what he wants to tell us, is it's a lie. If we think that pornography is going to give us satisfaction that our wife won't, it's a lie. If we think that we're safer and have some kind of intimacy with some kind of computer-generated or video-generated pornography, it's a lie. So what they do is, it says here, they exchange the truth of God and how he wants us to live our lives for a lie. And they worship and they serve the creature, something that is created. And whether or not it's something that is part of God's good creation as he created, or it's something that we create with the work of our hands, or that we move our mouths around and we have software and with our ingenuity we create, 
either way, we substitute and push God out of our lives by seeking satisfaction, safety, security, some kind of significance for some sort of image, but by worshiping it, by serving it, by giving it all of our time, by giving it our energy, by trusting in it, it actually ends up destroying us, and we push God out. So it becomes a substitute for God, our creator, but we think it becomes a substitute for something else, like a substitute artificial intimacy that we don't feel with our wife, or a kind of satisfaction that we don't feel with our wives, or something that we think as teenagers, teenage boys that we fantasize about. It's a lie. That's what he wants us to know, is that it's a lie. And then he tells us that they're empty, that these are empty. They look like they are alive, alive. They look like they have a soul. They look like they have a spirit, but they're really empty. And so here, both in Psalm 135 and in Psalm 115, there's this mockery. The psalmist says, look, they've got mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, they don't see. They have ears, they don't hear. They have hands, but they don't really feel, and feet, but they don't walk. And that was truly the case 2,000 years ago when you had idols that were made of stone or of wood, and then you put gold, and you put silver over the top of them, and you plated them. And that was true back then. And then somebody will say to me, wow, you know, there's computer-generated, video-generated idols that people watch. They speak. You know, our computers and artificial intelligence, they see, they hear. Maybe they even feel, maybe they even move. But what he's trying to say is that they're dead, they're empty, they have no life, and they have no spirit inside. They may look that way, but they don't have that. And so idols are lifeless, and we have to really understand a word for breath. So here in Psalm 115, he says, they don't make a sound with their throats. There's nothing that comes out of their throat. Psalm 135 is a little bit closer to it, and he says there's no breath in their mouths. And I really want you to see what it says there in 118, because this is the thing that kills us. This is why idolatry is so destructive, and this is why pornography is especially destructive. It says that those who make them and those who trust in them, those who seek satisfaction, security from them, who find some kind of intimacy from them, they're going to become like them. And what are they? Look at verse 17. There is no breath in their mouth. So then you think, okay, well, that just means there's no breath. But that's not what it means. The word here, breath, in Hebrew is rach. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's pneuma. Rach and pneuma actually have both a kind of a superficial meaning and then a deep meaning. And the superficial meaning for rach and of pneuma is actually just breath or wind. That's the superficial meaning. But the deep meaning is spirit or soul. So there's a play on words. When Adam is created, what does it say? It says that God breathed into him the breath of life. But ruach has the two meanings there. Breathe, breath, and then a soul. He became a living soul. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Adam became a living soul. So when it says here they have no breath, what it means is not just that they don't breathe in and out like air going in and out. It means there's no soul inside of them. So if it says, if you get involved with all of these idols and you have no breath in you, what it really means is it destroys your soul. It destroys your spirit. It destroys your relationship with God, and it destroys your relationship with other people. And essentially, it will cause so much damage to your soul that you become soulless like them. You not only imitate what they want, you not only seek what they give, but you actually become dead like they do. And I'm going to tell you, your parents, you need to wake up. Um, parents need to wake up. There's a lot more that our kids are seeing than we know. 
and, and kids get exposed to pornography at a much younger age than we know. And they get it from kids at school, whether it's a public school or whether it's a Christian school, they get it from their friends. You know, you get people that make suggestions. But, you know, sometimes when the kids are upstairs alone, you got to check what they're doing. Because sometimes they're falling into watching pornography. And sometimes when there is a broken relationship between a husband and a wife, and they're not talking, and the communication is broken down, you may not know, but there may be another person in your life, but it's not another woman. It's actually a pornographic video or a computer-generated images that, you know, that people have found as a kind of a false intimacy. And the thing about pornography and sexual idolatry is that pornography is not just a sexual sin, it's really a sexual idolatry. And you're seeking something to take away your pain, you're seeking something to give you satisfaction, but there's this cycle of shame, and the cycle of shame that people fall into really is destructive to the soul. That's why it says that there's no breath in them. And so with the cycle of shame, you know, people end up, you become enticed, you start thinking about it, you get tempted by it, and you're fighting it off, and then somebody will kind of go through this conceiving of watching it, and when it says ritualization, ritualization means that a lot of times when somebody wants to watch pornography, they want to fight it, they want to say no, and then there's these little rituals that they go through that helps them go forward to actually watching the pornography, and then they fall into the sin, they act out, they watch, and then when they get done, they feel a sense of shame. And then they'll confess to God and ask God to forgive them, and then the cycle starts all over. But the thing about pornography, there's a cycle of shame, and what it does is it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and then people kind of slowly over many, many years go down a rabbit trail until it has control of them. But what ends up happening? When you go into that cycle and you have fallen in to watching porn and acting it out, and then when you're done, the way that it makes you a slave is that when you feel shame, you end up feeling kind of a self-hatred, a self-loathing, and then you, the next day, you find yourself the next day distant. You're distant from your wife, you're distant from other people, you go to church, you're distant from them, you put on a big facade, and slowly, 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 you become farther and farther and farther away, but it's killing your soul. And so people fall into this bondage and burden of shame and self-loathing as they go deeper and deeper and deeper. And one of the things that I've learned, two things that I've learned in talking to people. One, one has to do with wives. Wives. When a marriage falls apart because of pornography, and I do not understand, but a woman will say that it would have been easier if he was having an affair with a woman than having an affair with a video or having an affair with pornography. And, and I don't quite understand, I'm not a woman, I don't get it, but there's this sense that I have been rejected, not for another woman. If it was for another woman, it would be really super bad. But it's not that I've been rejected for another woman, it's that I've been rejected for these videos. I've been rejected for these movies. I have been rejected and I'm losing my husband because he's throwing himself into these computer-generated pornographic movies or anime, or whatever it is, that he is falling farther and farther and farther away. 
And so it's almost, for a woman, they feel it's almost a greater insult to them and a greater sense of rejection than it would if it was another woman. Pornography is a form of adultery. It is as if they are committing adultery. The second thing that I have learned is that people will go along and their lives will be perfect, it will look really good, and then they suddenly explode or implode. And what I mean by that is, if you have an alcohol addiction on the surface, you can see, you can see the results of alcohol playing out in their life. If they have a drug addiction, you can see some of the effects of it, and you don't know exactly what's wrong, but you can see that there's something wrong, and then when things kind of fall apart and they hit bottom, you're not surprised. But pornography is hidden, and so you don't, other people don't see it, and their spouse doesn't see it and the parents don't see it, but it goes along year after year after year, and it slowly changes a person's character, it slowly changes a person's personality, they become a little bit more warped, they become deeper and deeper and deeper sunk into this quicksand of shame and self-loathing and of hatred, and they feel worthless, they feel broken, they feel hopeless, they feel like they have no power, and so they fall deeper and deeper and deeper, and then when their lives implode, a lot of times it's when their wife finds out there's this divorce, their whole life just completely falls apart or implodes, and then everybody kind of looks and they're trying to figure out what's going on, but the truth is neither the wife nor the husband nor the father or the mother or the teenage boy, they're not willing to talk about the pornography, so you don't really kind of don't know what's happening, you just know that things have fallen apart. And so everybody kind of sits back in shock. Um, but people need to know that there is a way out. People need to know there's a way out. And I'm going to tell you, the whole idea, you know, that we can just like turn to a buddy of ours and say, hey, can you hold me accountable? Um, it's a nice idea, but it's not enough. Pornography is so powerful. It's so addictive that actually you need a counselor. I, there are lots and lots and lots of Christian counselors who specialize in pornography, sexual, specialize in sexual addiction. This is so deep, you kind of need to get to this depth, the roots of what the problem is with a counselor or with a sexual addiction group. But above all, you need to know the power of God to change you. So I think that you need counseling. I think you need an addiction group. And I also think that above all, you need to really seek God. So if whether or not you yourself are struggling with pornography, or you see your teenage boy and you think he's struggling with pornography, or a college kid who's struggling with it, or a husband or a wife or a brother-in-law or whoever, and you know that that's going on, there's only one thing that will really ultimately take care of it, and that is God. And so we need to be able to see the goodness of God and the greatness of his power. And see, this is where I want to challenge you, is to really truly seek God, because God is able. God is able to deliver us. If he can rescue people from slavery in Egypt, he can rescue people from slavery to pornography. So it says here, you know, that the Lord, what does it say? The first thing right out the bat, the Lord is good. So his goodness is towards us, but he's also great and he's more powerful than all of the other gods. He has goodness towards his people. He's great and powerful above all gods, all idols, including idolatry, and that he's capable of doing whatever it is that he pleases on earth, in heaven, in heaven, on earth. He's able to do anything, and the Lord actively works to vindicate his people, and some translations will say to judge his people, but actually it's really judging the other things, like they judged the gods of Egypt. He judged Pharaoh and rescued his people. And the word here for vindicate actually means to set things right. So he's going to set things right for his people, and he will have compassion on all of his servants. So God has all of this goodness for us. And then another thing is that we need to know that he has come and using his power to redeem. And redeem means to set free, to set free. And that's what he does in Egypt. That's what he does. He sets us free from Satan. He sets us free from sin. And he'll set us free from pornography or any other kind of addiction that we have. And so we've got to be able to see what he says here 
in terms of any kind of addiction. So the Lord, he struck down the firstborn of Egypt, and that's the last of nine plagues, and all of those nine plagues that were before all had to do with gods, the Egyptian gods. So he destroys each of these gods. He sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and his servants who represent to us Satan, sin, and bondage to his kingdom. But I want you to see this word, his own possession, because this is a powerful thing. In Psalm 135, 4, he says, the Lord he chose. He chose you. He chose Israel. It says, the Lord he chose his own own possession. He chose Israel as his own possession, and this actually applies to us too. First Peter 2, 9. He has made us a chosen race and made us his own possession. Titus chapter 2, I think it's verse 14. He has redeemed us as a people for his own possession. So this applies to us. He's made us his own possession, and then you got to realize that this goes back to the Exodus. The Lord, he chose you as his own possession. This is what Moses says 40 years after the Exodus. The Lord, he chose you as his own possession. He redeemed you from the house of slavery. And this goes right back to what started as prayer. And that's what I want to get to is prayer. 40 years right before crossing over the Jordan River, he thinks back to what happened 40 years before, and he reminds the people that his power is available for you. The Lord, he chose you as his own possession. You belong to him, and he redeemed you. But notice what he redeemed you from. He rescued you. He set you free from the house of slavery. And all of this goes back to starting with prayer. The whole process of being set free from slavery, set free from bondage to the idols of Egypt, all started with prayer. So chapter 2, Moses writes, Israel groaned. And this is something that we feel inside. If a person is struggling with pornography, and they feel the sense of loathing. They feel the sense of shame. Inside, they're groaning. And if you struggle with it, you need to take that groaning and turn it into prayer. And not prayer once, not prayer twice, but prayer over and over and over. Because if people fall and they cycle down into pornography, the only way out is you kind of cycle your way out of it until you gain victory and complete freedom from it. So you groan that turn this into prayer because of your slavery and your bondage to this addiction, to these images that control you, that make you feel full of shame, that make you feel isolated, that are destroying your marriage. You pray. Pray for yourself. You pray for your teenage boy. Pray for your husband. You know, if you suspect anything, you pray. And then it says that the prayer, their cry for rescue for slavery, rose up to God and then when God comes to Moses all those years later, so you got to understand, this is praying over and over and over, year after year. So you've got to pray for years sometimes. I'm not telling you pray for a week. I'm not telling you pray for months. I'm telling you pray over and over and over and over until the freedom comes. Moses heard God call him from the bush, but what did he say? He says, I'm come. Why did I come? The cry of my people, the groaning because of slavery, the cry of my people has come up to me, and I have seen the oppression, the slavery of their pornography and their addictions, and I have come to set them free because I can see the oppression. I can see how they're broken. And so I will come with my power. So I kind of come to this one thing. Do you suspect that your sons are struggling with pornography? Any kind of addiction? Are you struggling with it? Are the kids in the teens group struggling with it? You know, is it affecting your marriage? Uh, do you feel isolated from your wife? Do you feel trapped and cut off and isolated from everybody else in your fellowship? The place to start is you've got to be set free. And God has the power. He is good. 
He's powerful. He's greater than that addiction. But the thing is, God has given you free will. And what that free will means is that you need to pray to him and you need to ask him. So that's my one prayer. My one prayer for you and my one challenge for you is that if you are struggling with it or you are afraid that somebody around you is struggling with it, the one place to start is with prayer and you pray over and over and over and over again and God will set you free and I do believe that God can restore marriages that are broken and God can restore hearts that are crushed by the burden of shame and make us whole. God can completely set us free and restore us and then give us freedom, not only from the addiction, but also from that sense of shame and guilt and actually give us a sense of joy where joy had once been gone. Let me pray. Almighty God, I do pray for all of us that you, God, will work in our lives and protect us, God, from this scourge. In your name I pray. Amen. So the benediction comes from Galatians, and this is about freedom. Galatians 5, let us bow for the benediction, um, and then afterwards you can send in your tithes and offerings. Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, keep standing firm in that freedom and do not allow yourself to be subject to slavery again and live a life filled with the Spirit. So I pray that you will all have a great time, and I do pray that you'll all enjoy this week and actually enjoy the weather that has just been so cool for us this summer. Um, and have a good time. May God be with you, and may God bless you. Amen.